Good evening. You can start. I'm Andy Bernheimer, um, professor of architecture, or assistant professor of architecture um, at the School of Constructed Environments, uh, an architect with an office in Brooklyn. And I'm David Levin, associate professor of architecture, School of Constructed Environments, and partner uh, at the architecture firm Levin Betts. Um, we'd like to thank you all for coming tonight. Um, we have a little bit to say to you all, and we have some fir first have some thanks to offer. Um, we'd like to thank um, Dean Robert Kirkbride, um, Dean Joel Towers, uh, the School of Constructed Environments, um, and the support Bethany Camarati, he and Dean for their um, really, really great efforts in getting this together. We'd like to thank the Provost Office for initial uh, grant support, which supported research, which has, which has led to this, this program. We'd like to thank the AIA New York uh, for including this event as part of their October programming. And we'd love to thank, we'd love to thank um, HML, the Healthy Materials Lab, John Sara Ruth, Allison Mears, Abby Calhoun, Lena Kuvella, and all the others there for their financial, moral, and administrative support. This event really could not have happened without their insight and their backing. So we're indebted to them, and we really look forward to a lasting collaboration between what we're calling the Metropolitan Housing Lab and the Healthy Materials Lab. We'd also like to remind everyone about the second day of this. Tomorrow morning, beginning at 9 a.m., uh, in the lobby outside the Kellen Auditorium at the Sheila Johnson Design Center, which is across the street at 66 Fifth Avenue, we'll have a panel discussion with several illustrious practitioners. Uh, these architects will present case studies of housing and then participate in a moderated discussion uh, following their presentations. And we'd like to introduce them tonight very briefly. Uh, Elizabeth Whitaker of Merge Architects in Boston, Brian Phillips of ISA in Philadelphia, uh, Anne-Marie Decker from Duval Decker in Mississippi, and David Dow from El Dorado in Kansas City. The moderator, Mark Lamster, is an author and historian, uh, and we'll talk about him in a second because he's participating in both events. So again, 9 o'clock for coffee, 9.30 for the formal event at the Kellen Auditorium. So we're really excited to have Larry Scarpa here this evening. That's my section. That's your section. We're extremely Go. excited to have Larry Scarpa here. It says stop. <laughs> and if Andy will allow me, I'll tell you a little bit about uh, Larry shortly. You outrank um, me, so go. <laughs> um, first, we'd like to introduce you to the Metropolitan Housing Lab that Andy has touched on a bit, or MHL for short. Uh, the lab is a nascent effort um, that is founded by Andy and myself uh, here at Parsons. Uh, and it's an outgrowth of about five years now of um, teaching uh, housing, of working on projects with the New York City Housing Authority, uh, particularly on um, a book that we called NYCHApedia. There was an extensive study of, of NYCHA's uh, assets in graphic form. Um, it also included student researchers, and um, the, the lab also started with ideas about uh, a, a study of UK housing. Um, uh, a trip that Andy and I made and gave uh, a presentation in Liverpool at a housing conference. Um, and um, we'll talk, talk about the lab um, briefly. Uh, the Metropolitan Housing Lab proposes that housing is more than buildings with apartments. We propose that the range of factors that comprise human habitation in the city must be brought into the wholesale recasting of housing. These factors include infrastructure, nature, people, food, jobs, health, and various modes of dwelling. Given the lack of equity in the increasingly privatized city, these factors both, both expand and provide for all citizens. The lab also invites academics and professionals committed to the issues of urban housing to examine the current processes that either produce or hinder its realization. Area focuses which are great, are architecture, environmental justice, healthy living, affordable housing, indoor air quality, healthy and sustainable material cultures, community policy, just to name a few. The MHL will locate the most innovative approaches to housing during this time of focus on dwelling and equity in New York City, a result of both unavoidable social pressures and intentional political directives. Uh, the lab will, over time, invite participation in discussions such as these, uh, workshops, and through design inquiries 
set new courses for how New York City's residents dwell and how the city's existing housing stock and form <clears throat> can be reformulated to address the pressures of urban growth, uh, climate, health, and social change in the 21st century. Uh, in terms of this evening's and tomorrow's event, one of the key focus, uh, one of the key words in the previous sentence about the approach of the lab is design. Since the main focus of this symposium revolves around design, design issues intrinsic to the making of affordable housing, we'd like to define design and to define a few other key terms inherent in this gathering tonight and tomorrow. First, affordable. Webster's defines affordable as, quote, having a cost that is not too high or reasonable, unquote. Uh, interestingly, Webster's also connects affordable with housing in a phrase that exemplifies the definition of affordable. The word reasonable is significant for its connotation of low cost, but more notably for a host of definitions that one could assign to the word reasonable that are beyond cost and have more to do with reason, logic, and perhaps something that is just okay or simply not <laughs> unacceptable. Second, housing is defined by Webster's as, quote, shelter, lodging, dwellings provided for people, unquote, and also, quote, something that covers or protects, unquote. And finally, design. So design has many definitions in Webster. And as a design school, this is probably thin ice, but let's go. <laughs> These include, quote, a particular purpose or intention, a mental project or scheme, a decorative pattern or a plan or a protocol for carrying out or accomplishing something, unquote. Design in the context of the MHL and of this symposium, housing left, right, and center, is all of these things and is fully conscious of the fact that there are a myriad range of factors that influence how housing is formulated, including economics, politics, and social issues. In the context of this discussion, design and the role of the designer in the making of dignified housing for people is a creative act that is also based in aesthetics, organizational approaches, design traditions, and the idiosyncratic <laughs> sensibilities of the designer. A central question that the conversation this evening and tomorrow will raise is how one goes about designing housing. How does one synthesize deep complexity, competing voices, contradictions, perhaps, and just simply design? What are the questions? What are the constraints? And what are the opportunities for design and for housing? All right, one other thing to note. If it isn't already apparent from the guests we have here for this event, the lab statement's focus is on New York City. So other than Mark Lamster, who is a native New Yorker, though transplanted to Texas, we do not have participants from New York City here for this event, other than all of you. This is intentional. We all know New York. Most of us live, work, wrestle with this place. We believe that it is vital to extract ourselves from this city at the outset, to break our habits, to see other places, to witness and hear about solutions from places with different rules, different climates, different communities, though with potentially common goals for elevating this housing typology. We will remain rooted in New York, but for the first event, we wanted to travel a bit. So we look forward to hearing from you, our colleagues, our students, about your thoughts on this effort and we may even call on some of you to participate. So now we'd like to introduce tonight's participants. First, and you will meet him later, Mark Lamster. Uh, Mark is a, one of my oldest and closest friends. Uh, Mark is, as I said, a native New Yorker, though no longer here that often. And Mark is the architecture critic for the Dallas Morning News and a professor in the architecture school at the University of Texas at Arlington. In 2017, he was a Loeb Fellow at the Harvard University Graduate School of Design. And in 2016, he was given the Robert Deckard Award for Civic Journalism, the highest honor bestowed by the Dallas Morning News. He is the author of several books on a myriad of topics, and he's currently at work on a biography of the late architect Philip Johnson to be published by Little Brown. Um, our keynote speaker um, is Larry Scarpa. Very excited to have him here. Um, uh, Larry produces some of the most remarkable and exploratory architectural work today. He does this by looking, questioning, and reworking the processes of design and building. 
He treats his projects as opportunities to rethink the way things normally get done, making the ordinary extraordinary. His work is deeply rooted in conditions of the everyday and manages to change our perceptions and preconceptions, allowing us to see things in a new way. Uh, Larry has received more than 100 major design awards, including 20 national AIA awards and the 2014 Smithsonian Cooper Hewitt National Design Award. In 2010, his firm was awarded the National uh, and State of California Architecture Firm Award. His work has been featured internationally and he has taught and lectured at the university level at numerous schools. And uh, most particular to this event, he recently co-founded the Affordable Housing Design Leadership Institute to help develop more sustainable and livable communities. So please uh, welcome Larry Scarpa. Standards, uh, the safety like standards is the same. It's the same. One of Leo's personal uh, passions is finding out ways to provide environmentally safe housing to low income families. Take a look. We're standing here at the first green affordable housing project in the country. This is Larry Scarpa, the architect. Why don't you tell us a little something about the place? It's 44 units and it's the first project of its type. The building has 200 solar panels and that generates a large percentage of the power for the building. Tell me, why is green affordable housing important? It's very important because low-income families spend the largest percentage of their income on utility bills. So the big argument is that it's more expensive to, to build green. What, what is your response to that? The answer is really no. In fact, there's so much you can do that's actually cheaper. Wow. Leonardo, you are a very good reporter. Thank you very much. A new building that is energy conscious is now going up in Santa Monica, and it's getting a lot of attention. Channel 4's Patrick Healy is there, and he's got an inside look for us tonight. Patrick? Chuck Kelly, what's being built here are affordable apartment units. Apart from environmental green considerations, what is really timely now is the fact that this project will be able to generate 92% of the power it needs right here on the site. This early, the site offers few clues to the uniqueness of the structure rising here. Yet when you visit architect Hugh Scarpa Kadoma's avant-garde office, say hello to the boss on the razor, you realize a project that excites them has to be cutting edge. That was the first housing project I ever did. And I basically begged that client to hire me. Um, I tried. It wasn't that easy. You know, it took me a long time to get them to hire me. But I literally begged them to hire me. I was shocked at the attention that it was getting. Uh, to me, you know, it was just like what my mother would describe as Jewish common sense. You know, it uh, was kind of a simple thing, you know, natural daylight, cross ventilation. I mean, the building's organized <clears throat> uh, much like an old hotel or an old apartment building you'd see here where you induce airflow um, through the building. We just added things that I had visions of, 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 you know, a more energy neutral building like solar panels. And what I'll show you okay. shortly is uh, to mitigate stormwater. So this, this project also mitigated the stormwater for the entire city block in downtown Santa Monica. Um, it seemed like it was easy, but it also took, uh, we lobbied the state of California, we actually threatened to sue them um, because they put up obstacles of how we could actually use energy efficient measures on the building. And it took basically our, our uh, Congress people or state assembly to threaten lawsuits to be able to, to, to get this project done the way we wanted to do it. Um, I had sat in meetings over and over and over again about people doing affordable housing saying you can't do this. It's just not feasible to do it. You can't do it because of cost. And I was determined to show that you could do it. 
And overnight, basically, the state of California changed the rules for how affordable housing was funded. So now, today, every project in the state of California uh, meet, needs to meet, is required to meet certain levels of sustainability. It's really, we did this by example. Um, again, it's pretty simple. This is what, that's our, you know, 21st century brick. Um, it's a 300 square foot unit, but, you know, we focus on things like natural light, cross ventilation. You know, I always ask the question, anyone here hate natural light? You know, I didn't think so. Or, you know, good cross ventilation. That's like simple things you can do that just make sense. And so it becomes, how do you assemble these things? What we did do, which was different and you know, what I thought about is affordable housing projects largely suffer from kind of a lack of depth. So I, I use these, I use kind of solar in a way as an excuse to give the building depth. It, it could be anything. It could be perforated metal, take the panels off. It's really part of the design um, elements. So this is facing um, west, basically west, southwest. Um, when we did this, you know, people criticized us too about, you know, the putting the solar panels vertically. I mean, this thing, when it was done, also received so much criticism. And it's this has been pro, like someone going to the doctor for cancer. It's been probed so many times. If you look it up, there's books that have analyzed this thing for energy efficiency. But, you know, what I told people is that, you know, they asked me, hey, uh, why do you put the panels on the wall? It's like less efficient. And I'm like, yeah, you know. And uh, I go, yeah, yeah, a little less efficient. So as it turns out, they're actually not because if you don't clean them on the roof, they accumulate dirt. So they're about equal efficiency. And it's like, hey, that tree right there, that's kind of casting some shadow on your panel. Well, yeah, you know, um, but I would argue that a building that's an energy hog that everyone loves is more sustainable than a zero energy building that nobody likes. So, you know, what I would say, why do we need to make a 100% efficient machine? We're people, you know, we're not machines. So for me, the design of it, it's, it was a do, you know, we do, you'll see this in all of our work that it, it's dual purpose. It's, uh, it's part of the design. We make like the, um, these things, um, elements act in a way they're performative, but they're also part of the aesthetic. So we face, um, the same issues that everyone else does with cost and budget and so forth. So, you know, when they try to pull things off like the solar panels and then they run the energy report, they go, geez, we got to add more air conditioning without those. And I'm going, mm hmm. You know, so they're like, hey, it's a lot cheaper if we just put solar panels on the building. So, you know, we use them as a tool um, for that way. But it, it, you know, this is a was the first LEED certified building in the country. We actually worked with the USGBC to develop the standards for actually certifying residential projects. Um, but again, I think it's really more of a common sense building. You're protecting the west. Um, the north glazing is pushed to the front. You can see kind of south exposures, which have deep overhangs and shade it. Um, and, you know, you get this like happy interior. Nothing special, but a lot of light in there. So we did, you know, in this particular project, one of the things we did that uh, we used a system combined the solar and micro turbine. So that thing you see is a micro turbine um, and it's like a little jet engine. So we produce power right on our site and by producing it right on our site, it's 95 percent efficient as opposed to getting it off the grid. So in peak loads, this would <clears throat> kick on, you know, in the mornings and nights when people shower and stuff, and then the solar panels would do the makeup during the day. Um, so it was a whole combined system 
that work. And, you know, it was a struggle. The building department didn't know how to actually inspect it. Um, so, you know, we would get things like, well, if Southern California Edison approves it, we'll approve it. And Edison would say, if the building department approves it, we'll approve it. You know, so we had, I think, somewhere like 100 uh, building officials from around the country come visit it to look at it. You know, we were like, okay, but no corrections, you know, if you're going to look at it. And sure enough, we got corrections, you know. Um, but it, it was a project that was, like, rewarding and made me think a bit more deeply about housing. I, ha I had an interest in it. But my interest really got much deeper um, when I finished this because when I first wanted to do housing, I had a purpose, but I also looked at what was being done in housing. And I just said to myself, I wasn't in L.A. very long. I knew nobody, so I was doing little remodels and things like that. I said, you know what? Look at how bad the affordable housing is here. It doesn't take much to look like a genius, you know, so I started to pursue it for that purpose. I'm like, you know, I can do really cool project because everything else is so bad, you know. So I, you know, when I finished it, I just started researching more, you know, about affordable housing or housing. And, you know, I found these compelling facts about you, know, you guys know a lot about housing costs here. We have the same project or problem in LA where, you know, we have a negative 36% vacancy rate in LA, um, but, and the costs are going through the roof. So what's happened is, you know, it's these kinds of people that can't find housing, you know, our firefighters our teachers and people like that get driven out of like the cities. And, uh, you know, they have to commute from further and further away. We would have people commute two through two, two and a half hours from Palmdale in. And a lot of them are single parents, so they never see their children. So it's a it's a perpetual problem, you know, that we said, how can we like solve those issues of providing more affordable housing? Um, I, you know, as much success and accolades as we got with this project, I was also disappointed and, and kind of deeply troubled. Um, this is right downtown Santa Monica. And if you look right front and center, that's a parking structure on the ground level. The best I could do was convince them to put a community room on the street in prime, you know, commercial, real estate and it just didn't seem right and as much as i talked to my client they said we can't do it we can't finance it, it we just our bylaws won't allow us to do it and i said there's got to be a better way and you know again i revisited these beautiful things we were doing at the time in in la and said to myself that i you know i have to do something about it so I summonsed a handful of my colleagues um, and asked them to meet uh, to discuss the issues surrounding affordable housing. And so, you know, I had bankers, uh, attorneys, uh, other architects, planners, um, and a whole host across the board to we met at my office every the first Saturday of every month and we did this for more than a year and uh, we did all these like you know weird things like this was one of our proposals to take the six million tons of trash that we produce in LA and dump it in the ocean to make an island and that would you know we could build enough housing at our current density um, you know so we did all these these things. I, we also uh, wrote guidelines for what we thought made sustainable, affordable communities, and we put them out to people to actually test um, these ideas. We looked at other what other communities were doing. I found uh, Massachusetts had like the most interesting ordinance they they have, and I don't know if it exists today, 
but they basically have the, it's literally called this, the anti-snob ordinance. <clears throat> and it basically says that if affordable housing uh, crosses below the 10% threshold in any neighborhood, that any developer could by right come in and build an affordable housing project in that community. So you would get these affluent commu communities that would just say, make sure our housing doesn't get you know below 10%, but not more than 10.1%. You know, so we we tested all these ideas. We even got an NEA grant to do a competition, um, and our competition had almost no rules. We just stated a density that we wanted. And I was really shocked when we, we invited uh, a handful of people and paid them to compete. And I was surprised that the questions we got like from you know my colleagues were, well, what's the unit mix? How many bedrooms, how many this and that? And I was like, that's what I wanna know from you. Like you tell me what it should be. I, I want I want to seek new answers, not just tell you what's tried and true. So once we got past that, we got some really interesting ideas, and these are just some of it. So after almost a year and a half of doing this, we decided as a group that you know either we're going to do something more meaningful or disband. So um, uh, I wrote a grant and uh, to the NEA and we got some money and overnight we became a nonprofit group called Livable Places. And you know, our idea was to do development by, uh, to, like Colorado Court and as examples of what can be done and use those developer fees to support policy work. Um, as it turned out, our policy work became much more powerful. Um, in fact, we were getting so much in grants and other monies to policy work, it was actually supporting our development. And you know, our vision was to mix for-profit, non-profit developers to do projects. And that turned out to be a disaster. Um, so this is a project that we built. We bought this building in downtown LA. It was for Fuller Paints. We paid $3 million for it. Um, it's 100,000 100, square feet, and uh, we could have sold this building without doing a single thing to it by the time it took. We had 29 variances to get this project approved, and by the time we got it all approved, we could have sold the building at a $5 million profit. And, um, but we were going to build affordable market rate. This was one of our examples, and we, we pretty much this almost killed our organization uh, to do it, but we built it. It's got market rate on top, a lot of the affordable on the bottom, live work, mixed use. And we would go into these neighborhoods like this is just north of downtown Lincoln Heights. And these became catalysts for the neighborhood. So we were kind of a cash poor organization, but we had the funding behind us. So what would happen is after we did this, like we had developers like following us around. So wherever we would go after property, they started buying the property all around us. Uh, Cause no good developer wants to be first in the neighborhood. They want to be second. Um, so this project is now built, it's completed. Uh, it's long been occupied. But what we started to do was the policy piece. I, we, we didn't want to do anything I found that like our work in Colorado court, like getting the state assembly and people to, you know, we transformed a lot of the affordable housing policy um, with that project. So I found that the power kind of in policy. So we started to do work, like we started looking at things around LA, like bikeways, um, mass transit, um, and we had just built the blue line to Long Beach and the city was touting um, how great that they were promoting density along the transit line. Well, we did these studies and presented them to the planning department and showed them that there's actually zero development along, uh, residential development along the blue line, the entire blue line. 
And the head of the planning said to me, that's incorrect. I said, well, all the information comes from your department. <laughs> and they were like, really? So, you know, we proceeded to tell them why it doesn't work. So they started engaging with us to talk about zoning amendments and other things. So we, you know, we started to get really brave about what we would do. So we, we brought back this idea, which everyone told us we were crazy, was to densify the single family lot in LA. You know, we were thinking if you could just put two units on a single family lot, you double the density in LA. So what was an impossible task even my board said don't even go there okay well guess what we wrote it and it got adopted by the city of la so it's now known as the small lot ordinance by everyone and you know you can go online now there's a small lot ordinance website and there are pages after pages of all these really interesting projects now being done by mom and pop developers um, all over la so it's really become this, you know, like what people start asking, what is a small lot, you know? And so we've had some really cool projects that have been built where this would be a single family lot, it's five units. Um, you know, another one by Lorcan, same thing, more units. We did one in West LA uh, or West Hollywood, five units. You know, these are all would be single family lots. And right now I'm working on one another five unit on a single family lot. So it's been, again, a transformative idea uh, of that a policy that's really changed how we think about design in affordable housing. So, you know, what's now happened with it, like anything that's good, you know, questions come up like the building department. I go in for my project that I just showed you for and I you know, show them the design, and the planning people tell me, no, that's not the intent of the ordinance. And I go, really? I wrote the ordinance. <laughs> I'm telling you what the, well, no, that's not how we interpret it. So what's happening is, is they're making it more difficult to actually be able to do it. So you know, now this has come up recently, so you know, I, I always thought policy, once you did it, it's forever, you know, and I'm finding it's equally as volatile as do maybe a design's even more permanent than, than policy. But, you know, he continued to, to work in that area. But, um, you know, the, the, to build affordable housing, we're always looking, the cost is a paramount issue. Um, and so in that early project, Colorado Quarter, everything we do, um, because the funding is so restricted, you know, they generally, the affordable housing projects have a set amount of money, there's not a penny more. So if you go over budget, there's no more money. They're on a fixed timeline that has to be done within that timeline. You go a day over, you lose your funding. So we've kind of, I try to adopt the system that makes our buildings, uh, you know, I put this up like repetitive um, in a way. But like for me, this is so interesting, even though it's the same thing. And there are a lot of examples like these stacks of books, you know, if they were in perfect alignment, um, they would be completely boring. But the kind of, you know, the, the, the touch that someone puts on it that makes them lean or get out of a line, I think makes it, you know, it fascinates me. So I look for ways to how can you be repetitive and unique. And so I'm always looking at people like these are the quilt makers in G's Bend in one of the poorest areas of Southwest Alabama. And these women not trained as designers at all but they make these beautiful things, you know, and they're just stunningly beautiful, you know, and it's about like patterns. So I say to myself, how can like I practice architecture in that way? How can I be an artist, but also be, you know, so rational at the same period of time? So like I look, even this, this is a flight path, and I forget which airport this is, but basically the pilot gets the same set of instructions to take off or land, 
right? So it's not the instruction, it's the variation of the instruction which makes it like beautiful. So what I've tried to do is devise these strategies or ways where things can deviate naturally to make our buildings repetitive, but also unique. So this is one in um, West Hollywood. Um, this was a site of, uh, it was an old studio. Frank Sinatra recorded here and a bunch of other people. But uh, this is, um, you can see our site. It's a 12 unit building on a very busy road. Uh, it's Fairfax with great views of downtown and actually views of West Hollywood, the ocean. Um, you know, so you have this dichotomy of like, how do you take care of privacy and issues in an urban environment, but also take advantage of views, shield from the light. It's oriented east and west, which is not great for that. So I started to, again, look at other things. Like I started to look at these paintings by Patrick Hughes called, he, he's renamed them, but he, they were originally called Prospectivity, where he basically shaped the canvases so that they don't move, but the, the um, viewer moves around them. And so as you move, the paintings appear to move. So what we did for this project, I worked with a local vendor to design essentially what would be a shutter. And again, this is performative. It provides on the east and west of the building shade, privacy, thermal comfort. Um, and we just worked out this one shutter and then we repeated it over the entire building. So what happens is the building really gets redesigned every day or every, every hour by the tenants or the people that live there. Um, and so if they want to be warm, you know, they open it up. If you're an exhibitionist and you like to walk around naked in your apartment, you can do that too, you know? If you like to be more private, you can close, close them up. So, um, you know, and this was the one, one of those projects where the client said to me, uh, there's that's two hundred thousand dollars to put the skin on the building and so I said well take it off you know so they did their energy analysis with it and when they came back they're like well you know it's only gonna cost us like forty thousand dollars to do that we're gonna have to add air conditioning do all these change the glazing the whole thing so they wound up doing it you know this is again a, a lead goal or lead platinum building um, I don't even mention it anymore. Every building we do is pretty much lead platinum, whether our clients want it or not, they get it anyways. We just don't talk to them about it. In fact, I had one client, we did a house in Montecito, big house, they're very well, well known, well to do client. We finished it and the wife called me up and in a panic said, something's wrong with our house. And I'm like, well, what's wrong? You know, she goes, I, I think the, the the utilities aren't hooked up properly or something. I'm like, what do you mean? It's like, well, we're, we got hardly any utility bill. You know, it's like, you know, I don't, so something must be wrong. I go, you're okay. <laughs> you know, they could care less about it. You know, they would have a thousand dollar a month water bill that went to almost nothing. You know? So we just do it as a matter of course. For us, it's about design. The only time that I bring it up is when they're going to screw up the design. Then I go, well, you really need to have this, you know, it's for the performance. And it's really a simple thing. It's a screen basically put over more or less a box over a short porch. Now, we did all the fabrication drawings for this, and this is something more that we do. I want to show those we work with, the, the, in this case, C.R. Lawrence to basically work out how uh, we do these things and we're doing more and more of it because I find contractors get afraid when they see something new so you answer all their questions and they're no longer afraid. So, um, so we do that as a matter of course. The same thing um, as same principles as Colorado Court, induced airflow, uh, natural light and ventilation so you see a variety of units that all have, you know, nice light, nice cross ventilation. And we always do things like this, like you can see the kitchen uh, 
backsplashes back there. Those are actually recycled skateboards. We just cut them up and made little things out of there. So we always, we use a lot of recycled content material. Um, another project downtown Santa Monica, it's for mentally disabled people. Um, we simply took these, you know, aluminum panels and we laser cut them or water jet cut them. We stacked them as deep as we could get so we can make one pass with a water jet cutter, you know, and some get a little frayed on the bottom and all that, but it was almost no cost. So, you know, what it does is it's on a busy street. People with, you know, mental disabilities or tend to have be schizophrenic in a way. So they have, need other issues of pri acoustical privacy, visual privacy. And so the, this actually acts in those in, in that to help that manner. Again, we have our 21st century brick. Um, these are actually smaller. They're 250 square feet. The doors open out um, so that, you know, tenants can't barricade themselves in the room. So it's based around two courtyards, um, as small as this thing is. Um, again, natural light, cross ventilation, simple nice things in the unit that make it livable. So you can see it's a urban area packed between two buildings. There's now a big hotel on, uh, on the uh, left-hand side of the building. So that's our site. And this is just gives you an idea of the project. This one is 252 units per acre so that's about the average density you have here uh, units there's there's uh, almost 60 units on 7,000 square foot lot and you guys can put a lot more here but in California that's like earth shattering um, and again you could see the the facade that acts as really the, the design element, but again, performative, and that it serves a function to, uh, you know, filter light and provide a sense of privacy. I managed to get the on the street, you know, commercial space here. So we're making progress in the interior of the units. Um, and this is another thing we do with the funding source because there's no uh, additional funding We've gotten really good at uh, delivering our projects on cost. And I, I have an ulterior motive for that because, because there is no more money, they, affordable housing developers set aside a much larger contingency because if they have a problem, you know, their project can go belly up. So I have my whole plan B. So by the time we hit framing, you can kind of see the light at the end of the tunnel and they can predict cost. And it's a use it or lose it system. So they start saying, man, we're gonna have all this money left over at the end of the project, what do we do? And I go, well, let me show you what we can do. So, you know, and part of that big strategy, like here in the, the inside, it's all formaldehyde free uh, materials, low VOCs, you know, this is a totally healthy material environment. And we, again, get that pretty much on every project. Uh, one project we didn't because the developer that we work with a lot on, a nonprofit group had hired a new architect and the same contractor did both and that project had problems. So they took all of our contingency that we had planned and had to put it in the other projects. Um, this is a 500 unit project we're working on right now in downtown LA, right on the 110 freeway. Um, again, when you get to this scale, like every penny multiplies big. So we kind of worked the units to be super efficient. And then we looked at the, the, the balconies or the perimeter of the building and what can you do with the perimeter? So normally you get a, flat slab that's that. We literally just worked on manipulating the edges of the slab to produce, you know, a facade that uh, could shade the building, but also provide interest to it. 
And so what you get is you get, you know, a building that's much more dynamic done with really simple means. And then we would apply that across larger areas. Um, so we do these kinds of studies and we cost them out. And, um, you know, you get what turns out to be a pretty interesting building that's done on a very economical uh, point of view. And we get that a lot, like a lot of people always say to us, um, we get nonprofits that shy away from us because they look at our buildings and they go, they got to cost a lot of money. You know, they're like real, they're too nice. They must cost a lot of money and they don't really at all. We're another project we're working on now is we're redoing the uh, Southern California flower mart. And this is this, the interesting story. This was owned by a Japanese co-op families that bought this building they made a co-op and all of these families were interned during the second world war but because they had a co-op they were able to retain the building so the original 52 families still own this uh, flower mart and what's happened is like every business it's been decimated by internet shopping you can even get fresh flowers online and all that now so they have very few of the original families or growers. And so it's shrunk. So we have a plan to not close the flower mart, but to reimagine it in a, in a way. So that's it, you know, pretty much now. This is what it looks like. It's not uh, anything like the original building anymore. So what we're doing is we're doing 300 units, 325 units of housing um, of which about 40% are targeted to um, low to very low income uh, uh, population. Um, so uh, you can see here, we, the plan is, you know, how do you build a tower on an existing building? So we're kind of taking down half of it um, and removing the flower mart into a half, moving them back once it's remodeled. So we have a, a tower that's somewhat cantilevering over. It's got a big cantilever over the existing building in order to retain that. So it's a series of kind of smaller buildings stacked up. It's uh, 24 stories. Our basic plan, you know, looks like that. And it it, it shifts so that all the cores remain in the, in the same location. This section kind of shows you how um, you can kind of see um, how it hangs over a bit of the existing. We're putting an event space on the roof um, as well with this. And then, you know, up at the top, you see double height spaces. Those will be the, the multi-million dollar uh, units up there. Um, and uh, we're about done with entitlement on this project too, so we'll probably break ground in about a year on it. Uh, adopted a similar strategy with like, how do you deal with the slab edge? You know, it's, it becomes an economical way to do it, but that can create a lot of interest and also be performative too, you know, shade and providing shade. So it, it yields basically a facade that's something like that. That's our site right in the uh, uh, downtown LA. And we've made some kind of massing models that you um, give you an idea what that looks like. And then the building is the, you know, what we have in LA, which is very different than what you have here. We have big blocks that are largely owned by a single person or entity. So it's, you know, the, the developments that you see in Southern California and LA in particular are massive because they're the entire block. For New York, for some developer to assemble an entire block is almost impossible. You know, you have some examples of it like Hudson Yards and things like that, but it, that's kind of the norm here. So what we've done is we've cut this building into three on the ground floor so you can actually, the public, can pass through the building. And this is one of the, the pass-throughs that you see right here. 
and then some of the street views so you get this kind of changing pattern um, of the facade from different um, different ways that you walk down the street um, the existing building and here's again the view through the paseo the main paseo um, cutting through the building and uh, you know as you would look up as you pass through there <clears throat> we're also working with a group called 18th Street Art Center and uh, you guys know what artist lofts are right you know expensive condos um, this is a uh, artist lofts but real artist lofts 18th Street is an organ they have a residency program um, and they they basically provide artists workspace for emerging artists and they've been in this location for 30 years um, their buildings are a group of uh, aging buildings um, that uh, the building the sawtooth building you see on the right is barely standing up so that's one we're, we're actually taking down we're going to take it down and replace it with a new gallery uh, for them on the ground floor and uh, 20 units of artist live work housing. And again, it's like bright key central area, 17th Street in Santa Monica. It's an industrial district. The city, this is the only nonprofit arts organization that is it, that the city of Santa Monica has. So they rezone this area around what 18th Street can redevelop. So they, when you get up in the air, you have ocean views. But again, you have the same issue of orientation. You're looking east and west. So we had this kind of concept of like, you know, to provide the, because you have such great views as to, to frame these views in a way to, so to look at like the windows or is like a set of apertures or frames and to use them, you know, not only for a way that the artists can display their work, but also provide, uh, uh, you know, thermal comfort uh, and depth to the facade. So here you can see uh, it along the street, the galleries basically on the ground floor. It has an open split space for art and then all the housing is uh, above it. Here's the ground floor with the cafe, open space, that, and, and it ties in with the existing buildings. That building on the top is a performance space. It's a 100-seat small theater. So those all integrate, and then the units basically stack up above that with the facade giving the kind of depth for thermal uh, performance. Here's a section, show you some of the elevations. And then this is all made from CLT, cross-laminated timber. So it's going to be big panels of cross-laminated timber. That'll just all be bolted together to kind of make the facade. The whole building will be cross-laminated timber. We're also working on a project in Florida. This is a senior housing project in the panhandle of Florida for the St. Joe Company. Um, this is a 110,000 acre project, a little project. Um, they've asked us to look at a model for senior living, you know, a new way of senior living. And if you've ever been to the Panhandle of Florida, you know, you can see from that site, it's really beautiful. They, they owned um, almost 700,000 acres there. They've developed pretty much everything on the coast in Destin, watercolor. Um, and now they're to the uh, interior parcels, so the cheap par parcels, as they would call. So they're looking at this model in Ocala, Florida, called the Villages. I don't know if any of you have heard of it. Some of you may have, yeah. It's a retirement senior community where they provide all these services for seniors. It's got the highest rate of STD, STD <laughs> in the country in a retirement home. So they're having a good time there. And they're selling these homes like really, really cheap. So like our client sees this as their competition. So what they're trying to do is create a different kind of neighborhood. Um, you know, there it looks like the typical, 
track single story track homes so they've asked us to look at ways to maybe do another model so we've kind of taken a portion of this and we started to look at like other cities and neighborhoods like um, you know Savannah and other things like look at their block structure um, look at things like uh, walkability squares and so we've done this kind of analysis of thinking about parcel strategy like how do we make it so they can actually parcel things and how do things fit together so we've come up with this this strategy of having much much smaller parcels so it's like an 80 by 80 foot parcel that could then be 40 by 40 and they turn into these blocks which actually become uh, walkable and um, you know we're, we're more than doubling the density of a single family neighborhood so it's not super high density but for like this community it's really high density so you wind up getting this kind of every block has uh, uh, this is a multi-block configuration but you get every block winds up with these we've done three or four different prototypes that can fit together in a variety of uh, configurations that have walk streets through them and a little tiny pocket park in there. We've been able to do this and double the density of, uh, of your typical kind of suburb that, you're, that they're building for this. So we've kind of done it as more of like a golf cart thing where people can get around or even walk. So we've done all these studies about uh, you know what people can walk in the heat and we provide tree-lined streets and how much they would walk. So all the, the, the neighborhood uh, winds up with a series of little pocket parks. And so you'd wind up with, you know, fabric that might look more like this and consist of, of you know, more of a variety of homes um, in scale. And then each park, each pocket park could then be uh, developed in a way so that each block has a different idea, you know, whether it be a garden, uh, a bosque, uh, recreation, and so that each neighborhood or each block becomes unique and we create a network uh, of unique kind of open space uh, within these blocks. So we've done now the uh, prototypes of what the units look like, same thing with constructability. Um, these are being estimated now uh, if you can believe this at less than forty dollars a square foot yeah so this is what uh, uh, what we call the nest house they're basically two houses uh, put together they're really compact houses uh, again taking in some of the things from the south of having shaded porches uh, spaces where you know seniors can sit out on a walkway communicate with each other um, and really um, you know be like kind of a wonderful neighborhood so I'm just showing you some shots of, of what that might uh, ultimately look like um, this is one we just finished this past year that's got again a lot of accolades it's uh, for disabled veterans that's called the sixth and um, you know, I, it's funny, my, our client, he's a, he, he's a great guy. You know, I'm going to show you a little clip. You'll get to see a little bit about him. But he says, it's amazing what you can do with a box with a couple holes in it. You know, he distills it right to the essence. But, you know, in some sense, he's right, but it's a bit deeper than that. There are some, you know, I would hope it is. You know, we have these strategies of, where the holes are and how they provide natural light um, you know how they protect from the view so one thing again with with uh, uh, veterans a lot of them as I like the mentally disabled they suffer from issues of schizophrenia and you know, part of what the Skid Row Housing Trust their mission is to reintegrate people but Mike Alvedris will tell you that design is part of the healing process and he says you can't solve a lot of these issues without housing people and housing them well so again we don't we but we, it's hard for anyone to tell our market rate housing from our affordable housing for us it's the same thing 
it really is the same. We treat them the same. But it's because they're disadvantaged. We don't treat them like a subculture of people. They're the same people. And, you know, there's always this thing that it's the unknown is fearful. Um, you know, there's people that live in our projects. You can't tell that they have problems. They look like you and I. So the plan is around a courtyard. But what we, we try really hard to do here in this particular space is to give a public space where people can come together, but they're not forced together. So there's a lot of peripheral spaces where people can participate, but hang out on the edges. So they can integrate as they feel like they want to integrate, or they can isolate themselves as they, as they want, but they can't go hide in a room. They can get in a corner and see what's going on, but they cannot get in a room and close a door unless they go to their unit. So we offer kind of a variety of experiences for the tenants so that they kind of you know, by choice, they can choose how or what speed that they uh, choose to reintegrate. So you can see the sections with the, the public space. It has a green roof. Again, it's a lead platinum building. Uh, we just do them all that way. And um, this just shows you the, the LA, we have a, a kind of it's something we're working on now. There's this like 50 foot cap because it defines like where you can end with wood frame construction. So everything seems to be, you know, if you go above 50 feet, it needs to be a hundred feet to work economically. So um, we're working real hard to change that. But you can see in this courtyard, you know, what we do is a lot of times it, it's, it terraces down and so when you stand on this courtyard, rather than have a railing in front of you, it's down at floor level. So there's technically no railing on it because of our terracing. So it's a lot more exposed. It's a lot more open and welcoming, but it's secured and private. And they have services uh, on the ground level of this, ha of this place. So this is where the people can come from the outside for all kinds of social services and even their own tenant population. Um, what you see on the street, the courtyard. And the, we always try to get a community room and we, you know, we're blessed with great weather in Southern California. So we make big doors and they always leave them open. And uh, again, you can see the unit, pretty simple, all materials from aldehyde free, natural comes from our excess budget. We get it every time. Um, and, uh, you know, it's just a nice, clean environment. It has a green roof and, a, you know, now uh, it's almost impossible for us to provide public space on our buildings without doing uh, roof terraces now. So we're really dense, densifying. California has, uh, we now have, uh, it's been mandated that all of our buildings have to be energy neutral by 2030. So this stuff will all be old hat before you know it. And from the back, it's a pretty gritty, you know, neighborhood. Um, MacArthur Park, the, of where this is, is basically the density of, of Manhattan, New York, very dense. We have, you know, I just show you a variety. We have a whole slew of these kind of projects from 60 units in North Hollywood to some high-rise affordable projects in downtown LA. Um, this is one we're collaborating with Lorcan O'Hurlihy on in Culver City right at Robertson Station. Uh, we're in the early stages on. And another one in, in downtown LA. Um, I wanna close with, with uh, something else. Um, this is something that I started about eight years ago. And um, I had this idea you know, that had been brewing after participating on the mayor's conference for city design to, you know, in all my, my involvement in housing, it still seemed that we were not really doing good design in housing. And I've seen these mayors come to the Institute and bring their problems to discuss with a, what was called a resource team um, and work, you know, this resource team of, 
again, finance people, landscape, urban designer, architects, you, you go across the board, brilliant people to work with these mayors on problems in their city. And I said, you know, why can't we do that for nonprofit and community groups, the same thing? So I talked to my friend, uh, Maurice Cox, and I, you know, we, I told him about the idea. He said, write me a grant. He was, you know, the head at the NEA at the time. And I had just gotten myself off the board of livable places. So I, I seem to constantly be trying to get out of doing things, but I keep doing more things. So I had just removed myself from the board at livable places. And now I had another task. So I got this grant and, um, uh, and Maurice and I really, it was Maurice and I who shaped this idea and neither one of us had, you know, the energy or the effort to really put in, put the time into this. So I called uh, my friend Katie Swenson at Enterprise Community Partners and I said to Katie, I said, hey, I got this idea and I got some seed money. He said, I said, do you think you'd be interested in doing this? And she said, well, you know, my boss is here. I think they, they would love this. They want to do this. So she got back to me and said, they love this. I said, you can have it. <laughs> so I kind of became an advisor to them. And, you know, we got a grant and we were going to do this one institute, which we did in Minneapolis in 2010, um, where we invited uh, eight uh, nonprofit community groups and we brought together a team of landscape, architect, uh, bankers, um, nonprofit developers, for-profit developers, and we put in a room for three days. And we work with this group to help them sort through issues and make, uh, you know, better housing, better community buildings. And um, we thought it was a, you know, a one-time deal. Well, here we are going on our eighth year, and we're on our eighth institute. Um, so, um, you know, our basic mission, we've done so much now with it. Um, if you go online, we produced an enormous amount of documentation about housing, affordable housing, and how it uh, plays better community building. So you can see here, these are the reports that have been put out. Um, and Katie's done an amazing job actually integrating it more with the Rose Fellows. And I've, I'm close to 100% removing myself from this too now. So um, Katie almost does it all within her group and I kind of just play a bit of an advisory role. But you know, what we do is this is like a key thing and is to show the benefits of affordable housing to communities. So I just grabbed this little snippet, but this is factual information that shows how good design and affordable housing can make neighborhoods and communities better. And so we've done an institute here in New York. In fact, I think a few people from the school bill, right? We're involved. Yep, yep, yeah. And um, um, we've had you know, I've sat in the room with some people and I can't remember and I probably wouldn't say the developer from New York who came to us with this awful project, awful project. It was just like I couldn't believe it. I was biting my tongue, you know. Well, this guy's come to four institutes now. He just comes to them. You know, he has he has drinking the Kool-Aid, uh, you know. <laughs> And that's kind of what we want is we want it to multiply and so that it takes on its own life um, beyond me. So I'm gonna leave you with this uh, little clip here. We've become a culture that ignores people and looks the other way. Our homeless problem, especially in Los Angeles, is so large now that it's almost untenable. Los Angeles has the highest number of unsheltered people anywhere in the country, and clearly you can see that in Skid Row. There's a lot of suffering that goes on. 
If you're not ready to live in the streets, it gets pretty profound. For those individuals who have been largely isolated and alone, beginning to try to build what solutions to homelessness can look like. I've known Mike for a long time, and this is really our first um, collaboration. The name of this project is The Six that we did for Mike, and that means that, in military terms, it means I've got your back. And really, Mike is The Six for homeless people. I think I was one of the first people who moved, who had keys, and I thought I, I, thought I was dreaming. And I came in and looked, it was empty. I was like, whose house is this? They said, yours. I got a little radio, a microwave, a crock pot. What more can you ask for? They have everything contained in their own unit, but then we Took have my breath away. Because I've been suffering for a number of years. Suffering for years. And uh, what are you gonna expect, you know? Breaking stereotypes of the homeless goes back to design. It says something. It says we care about you. Design definitely can empower an individual. If you ask Mike, he'll tell you that good design is part of the healing. A little bit like Frank Sinatra. If you can do it here, you can do it anywhere. No one has a bigger homeless crisis than we do here in Skid Row. I think it's absolutely a replicable model. All you need is the will to do it. These are our cities. Whatever we make here, Whatever buildings we build here, they're part of the larger fabric that defines our cities. I can't believe I have to compete with Leonardo DiCaprio. <laughs> Being a good-looking movie star isn't enough for him. Billionaire, he's got to start interviewing architects now. Uh, I guess um, so. Not happy about that. Um, that was really wonderful. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so I guess the first question for me coming from Dallas where, um, well, I think, you know, we saw Michael Maltzen in this clip. Uh, you talked uh, a bit about Lorcan O'Hurley. We saw your own work, which is phenomenal. It seems like there's so much really interesting affordable housing from a design standpoint happening in Los Angeles. So my question is, you know, is there something special in the water in Los Angeles? Is, um, uh, how, how did this school develop where this is happening? Uh, why is it happening there and maybe uh, and not in other places? Is this just a freak of nature? You know, sometime in, you know, we talk about in sports where sometimes they're just a, you know, a great athlete emerges and you're lucky if he happens to be in your town. So is Los Angeles just lucky to have a bunch of really talented architects doing affordable housing at this moment? Or is there something else structural that is leading to this kind of work? Yeah, you can go back well beyond this. You know, you go back to Green and Green, Irving Gill, Frank Lloyd Wright, Noitra. You know, none of us are from LA. I'm actually from New York. You know, and but as soon as you go to LA, you're considered an Angelino. Like you can't shake it, you know, and then you once you're in LA, you're like this sort of weird person. We're like, you know, it's a different perception in the Northeast. Like I joke with my friends here, I you know, I tell them I'm opening an office in Amsterdam and they go, Really? You got work there? I go no, I'm trying to get some work in New York, you know. Um, but, you know, we, we're, we, like I have friends who, like landscape people and others, who they go, well, I'm thinking of opening an office in L.A. I'm like, just come put your shingle on the door. If they like your work, you'll get work. There's no magic to it. There really is. It's, you know, got a history of innovation, you know, uh, for a long period of time. So people are open to do, you know, they better things, I guess, if you really want it. They're, we don't do things just to be different or be crazy. It's really, we're kind of seen as maybe these weird people, you know, that are doing these wacko things, but it's really quite measured. It's measured in a way that's beneficial, not just as a way to be weird or crazy. You know, there's some element of that, but by and large, it really is for some motivation or benefit. And so I think the housing 
is just a natural income. Like I said, I wanted to do it because the work was so bad and I thought it would be really easy to make it better. And, you know, we started around 2000 and now we did some good projects and now Michael's got on board, Lorcan, we got other people are seeing affordable housing as really a viable design market. Well, actually, that's a good question. Is it a viable design market? I, what percentage of your firm's work is actual affordable housing? And for the young architects here, um, I mean, you talked about this high-end um, a home that you did for a yeah. billionaire who doesn't have to worry about her water bill, <laughs> um, which is great. Well, um, it, it, that work is great, too. I'm um, question is, do you need to do that work? as to support the affordable housing work do you do that because you just like doing I, all these different ki types of work or can you can you be a young architect today and decide you want to do affordable housing and that could be a legitimate career choice absolutely and there's more than just that it's like in the whole community development i mean there's there like the rose fellowship is a great thing for young people where you know it's Enterprise community partners will pay for young, pay their salary for three years to work with nonprofit community developers, and they're linked into our uh, into our institute. There are things I do it. The affordable housing, it's it's not easy, you know. I mean, you have you got to have someone who cares. But even people, you know, they hear, hey, these guys did a really nice project. You know, the executive director speaks very highly of them. Let's give them a chance. You know, they can, what's happened to our neighborhoods are getting tough. So they come out against affordable housing. So a lot of the nonprofits have used design as a weapon, you know, saying, look, we hired these great architects. You're getting a great design. What are you complaining about? You know, so it's helped get projects passed. But at the same point, you have constraints of cost. You have constraints of you know limited contractors like we fight this all the time you know their timing we do stuff with exposed concrete and i come out and there's a two by four shot pinned into exposed concrete you know and i'm like to the contractor what are you doing you know and he's like oh we'll patch it up well you can't patch it you know so i get him to while, while i'm there to take it down because the owner you know, looks at it and goes, well, it doesn't look that bad. And, you know, we can't make them rip it out because we'll, you know, go over our time limit. And then I come out the next day and he's got another board nailed up there, you know. And so you're, as an artist, you're really fighting against it. So it's kind of, it's hard in that sense because the art of the architecture plateaus at a certain point, you know, when your client looks at it and goes, well, I don't think it looks that bad, you know, where you want them to rip it out. I think it's that point of creating a work that is has artistic integrity that is so difficult in affordable housing, even market rate housing, yeah. especially where I come from in Dallas. It's a fight yeah. I always seem to be having. I, David, I think it was David in your introduction, he started, he read off the description, I think the definition, the Webster's definition of housing, right? It was shelter, um, a place where you live, home, right? But it's interesting to me is that that's actually not the way the developer community thinks about housing at all. Those things never even occur. It, 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 housing is a commodity in right. America. Um, it's a product. I always get very disturbed when I hear real estate people talking about what type of product they have right. instead of, you know, <laughs> it's uh, a home. The, the ha you know, like the, somebody lives there. It doesn't right. matter. It's just, you know, widgets, right. units, whatever. It doesn't matter. So my question to you, long-winded one, um, <laughs> is how do, you, how do you get a developer to move from seeing what they're building as commodity, because it is, uh, to seeing it as uh, a project with artistic integrity? Very simple. We keep a detailed record of it. I show them our projects. I show them the cost per square foot that they're built at, and I show them the cost per square foot that they're sold at, and I show comparable product, cost per square foot they're built at, and cost per square foot that it's sold at. Then they get on their knees and bow to me. <laughs> <laughs> And they leave me alone, by and large. <laughs> <laughs> 
As a critic, I have not had that experience. <laughs> but I'm waiting for it to happen. I'm sure they'd like to see it if you want. <laughs> I dream about it a lot. Um, <coughs> Well, I, I, the w one thing you talked a lot about is sustainability um, in your work uh, from the very beginning of your uh, of your work doing affordable and I guess any any kind of work. Um, and I thought the flip side of that coin now, and I'm thinking especially with you know fires ranging all over California, um, is this concept of resilience. Mm -hmm. um, and and how do we deal? How do you? Uh, what are the issues when it comes to affordable housing, uh, when it comes to resilience, and how, are, how do they differ, say, from, or do they at all, uh, in market rate housing and in any of your housing projects? How are you starting to address that? How are you thinking about that? Has that evolved um, since you've been in, Yeah, in there, last there are actually bigger issues, I think, regarding, you know, it's it always boils down to cost. and. The, a lot of affordable housing projects get deeply criticized for their cost. So by and large, if you were to compare an affordable housing project and a market rate project, the cost per unit or square foot is higher on affordable than on market rate. And so you always hear people arguing, how do we get the cost down? You know, why is it so expensive? You know, where you build a market rate for you know, 100,000 per unit, and why does affordable cost 150,000 per unit? Well, because when you, there's no affordable housing project that I've never seen one in my career that has a single source of financing. There are usually at least five, sometimes we've had as many as 30 sources of financing. And so when we start a project, the very first thing we do is ask who's financing it because they all have differing, often conflicting design requirements for minimum sizes of rooms, for you know tile or linoleum of the bathroom. And so then they all have to be prevailing wage. So by the time you put all that stuff together, they're driving the cost up. It's not the designers. The designers are not driving the cost up at all. Like, you know, we just did a project by my house in Venice uh, affordable housing project. Um, the county housing department made us put air conditioning in it. Okay, my house, you know, which is like now in an area that's worth millions, has no air conditioning. Every, you know, we got five million dollar houses in our neighborhood that don't have air conditioning, but we got affordable housing that every unit has air conditioning. That, that's nothing compared to Dallas. In Dallas, we just built a a 50 micro unit uh, group of homes for uh, the chronically homeless. But due to Dallas zoning, uh, each one has 1.5 parking spaces. Right. And that too, we've done that too. The project I showed in downtown Santa Monica, Step Up, it's a city financed project in part. It's, you know, it's very dense. So it's got 24 cars parking on that site and because the site's so small there are lifts and it's got a big hole that garage costs three million dollars to build and nobody parks in it they're not allowed to rent it out so it's an empty garage there's like two cars in it or three cars and that's it and the city this is the irony is is the week there's an ordinance in the city of santa monica that says for affordable housing projects, you don't have to provide the parking. But in order to, for us to get that exemption, we would have had to go through a coastal permit, which is a discretionary approval. So when you build affordable housing, if you don't do it by right, everyone comes out of the woodwork. So they said, OK, we're going to spend $3 million for that. We could have built a whole other affordable housing project for that cost. You talked about. Um, design being a healing process, or maybe, or design as, a, or maybe that was in the, in the in one of the film. Pieces. I think and I might have. And you talked about have, uh, your. I might take it on myself too. You, you talked about <laughs> using you know Vox and other um, uh -uh. Uh, incremental uh, things that you do. You know, non formaldehyde uh -huh. uh, materials. I mean, maybe you could talk about. 
a little bit about, about building, how, how do you design healthy buildings, not just I mean, both materially and sort of more conceptually how you approach them? Are you thinking about like getting people into stairs, uh, getting, uh, yeah. how it works within the city? Is there a... I didn't talk about that, but that's one thing too. If you look at all of our projects, we don't put our egress stairs are not in a shaft somewhere in our building. They're open and they're in a place where they can be used. So uh, most of our tenants actually use the stairs as opposed to the elevator. Also, we've done many projects where we have subterranean parking and we put like a big hole in the parking and stair that comes up. So what happens is like I didn't show a project, but we saved $85,000 because we didn't have to mechanically ventilate. We mechanically ventilated it, but no duct work. So the makeup air came all through the hole. Light comes down through it. It's a much nicer space. It's not dark and people use the stair. They come up. So all of our projects, you'll see people use the stair, but we fight with the fire, the fire department. We have to go down on every single one of our projects every single one like the easy thing is, is just put it in a shaft in the corner because we they they know us down there at the fire but they you know if we send a junior person down there to the building department they come back and said well the fire marshal wants the stair enclosed you know so then i got to send a senior guy down there to fight with him and it's like don't you remember the last project we did this you know so it's it's real in, in a lot of ways it's a it's a it's hard you know, like you gotta, you gotta have some intestinal fortitude to make good design and affordable housing. I noticed that in the six. I mean, it seems like it's get the stairs and open space is a sort of the driver of almost yeah. uh, that, 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 that design. Right. So walking is a big part of it, but also the, 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 the you know, we also found that if you design it well, like if you make it nice and open, people take pride in their, the, like we have a lot of people, I hear them, you know, they're so proud like of the place where they live and so then they take better care of it you know they don't abuse it as much so you have better long-term maintenance on and that's one thing we've done which katie's really done is to show like design can improve your maintenance costs you know and then the just clean materials where you know you can natural light cross ventilation um, those things are easy they're free and they don't take much effort to do I, one question I just have is how, in a way, you move between or get from policy to design. Um, it seems like a, a lot. You, you spent a lot of time, you know, forming housing policy, uh, going through the bureaucratic fights, lawsuits, whatever, um, and to try and shape the sort of bureaucracy of the city. Um, and but maybe you could. How much time do you spend on that compared to how much time you spend designing? And also, how does I just you know you are doing inventive work? What it, how do you how does the policy shape the physicality? Yeah, like you can't. It's really hard if you have an idea that doesn't fit like zoning. You know, you can't just do it today. You know, like we've done we we. They have in, in cities that know us, they always make the anti brooks Scarpa rules because we like find ways to get around them. Like they do the stupid rule that if your building's, um, you know, above two stories, you have to step it back, you know, by a certain amount. So you have to do this wedding cake. So I found a way where you can actually put in a mezzanine and it doesn't count as a story, you know, and then I make the heights taller. So. You know, I got a 50 foot high building with no step in it and I go into the building department and they got, you know, the first correction, step it back above this height. And then I sit down with them and they go, oh, well, I, I guess it does fit in the rules. And then the next project I go in, there's an amendment that changes that, you know, you can only go up this high. Um, so the policy part gets you more longer term changes so I, I call it a parallel universe where like I can be a creative architect but at the same time I have soldiers out from 
past organizations that I've been involved with that are doing the dirty work for me now, you know, and so I think there's power in numbers. And if you can have enough effect on people, you get change. Like I think my generation or our generation, the whole issues of surrounding sustainability that come from our generation. And now we're, you know, at an age where we're in more leadership positions. So it's, it's just happening. So I think you're going to see a new wave, you know, probably when I'm at the end of my career of like even way better community design and way better affordable housing design. I mean, we have Rose Fellows out there that are in amazing positions and doing amazing policy work and change. They're just like, they're sort of the unknown right now, you know. I guess to maybe final question, <laughs> given the art timing, but... Um, I guess the most important question is what can what can the people here learn from what you're doing and from Los Angeles? Like how do how do we translate what are the most important takeaways and how do we move from commodity architecture to genuine actual architecture? Uh, because I know in, in in some cities we don't see it at all. In Dallas it doesn't it just even doesn't doesn't exist. Will you yeah, move to Dallas, please? <laughs> well, there, you know, we do get some of that too. There, it comes like there's this perception that people want a certain product. That's what they think. So you've got some developer who thinks that this is the, pro the product that the market can absorb at the highest rate or whatever it is. And it's most of the time's not true at all. So those are preconceptions that are really false. So I think the best thing to do is, is you know, you prove it by doing it. Like, you know, the first housing project I did, ever did, I was an expert on one project. You know, and sometimes that's all it takes. If you can show that it can be done, and it's not often easy, you know, anything that's worth doing is not easy. You know, if you show it can be done, then everyone jumps on, you know, and there's always going to be people, you know, doing other stuff. But again, I consider that I, you can work in your own parallel universe to make it work. It's not absolute one or the other. I guess that's how I treat it. Well, thank you very much. Uh, We're going to, thank you. We're going to, um, uh, we have a bar in the back of the room, so uh, we'll kind of informally, um, you can approach Larry, talk to anybody, talk amongst uh, this group uh, about any of the issues that have come up. But I also want to just thank you so much, uh, Larry, for framing the, the issues of design uh, and housing for this uh, symposium. Uh, I think you've set the course uh, for tomorrow. We invite all of you back uh, tomorrow from 9 to 12. Um, I th and Mark, thank you. Um, I think our speakers, uh, Anne-Marie, Beth, uh, David, and Brian, you can see that Mark is a generous inquisitor. <laughs> I think we'll have a, a, another a productive discussion tomorrow. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, no,